Okay, so that's going. Good, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up our anatomy book. So, um, okay, you know? so that's going. Ooh, good, good. <laughs> I'm like, who has their mic on mic? Who? Who? <laughs> it's me. That's what happened. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me today for our anatomy yoga um, clinic. So we will be using as a resource the Trusted Tried and True uh, Leslie Kamenoff anatomy book. There are two. Um, commonly we see used in yoga teacher training, the second edition. Um, and that's cool. The second edition is great for like that granular learning piece. If you want to understand the why in the um the physiology behind some of the what. Uh, the second edition is, is a great edition, but I myself, I prefer the first. And the reason is, is I do a little bit better with the broad strokes learning, um, show me a picture with what muscles are going to be using, what what are the primary movers in, in any given asana. And so as, as I go over this book with you, this is your required reading. So pull this out um, if you're in the yoga teacher training. And if you're not in the yoga teacher training, then I recommend you go buy a copy of this book. Uh, so with no further ado, let's get in there and just kind of get going. Um, so the first edition is the one that I'll be going off of today. Um, so if you're following along with the book, you most certainly can do that. Primary author on this one is Leslie Kamenoff, um, and the Asana analysis is done by Amy Matthew, and it's illustrated by Sharon Ellis. So, so those, are, those are the who's behind the what's and so on. I think it's always important to go through that. So there's different pieces of this book, and you know this book is actually, they have their whole own course that they offer, um, which is just amazing where they go in and they they break all of this down and that's the fundamentals course. If you're interested in that with Edge, let me know. Uh, one second here. Crisis averted. Okay, so let me get back to it. Uh, all right, so starting off with chapter one, the dynamics of breathing. So one thing we're going to want to essentially grab hold of is the impact of pranayama on asana and the impact of asana on pranayama. And what makes yoga yoga, you know, as we yoke those ideas together is the mindfulness and the presence, right? And so different people have a different take on that. Uh, but I think essentially there's a mindfulness component of yoga that might be seen in other, um, other uh, modes, modalities of exercise, but is really has, has been a, a mainstay of yoga for a good long time. And so then chapter two is yoga and the spine. Chapter three is understanding the asanas. Chapter four is the standing poses. Chapter five is the seated poses. Chapter six is the kneeling poses. Chapter seven, supine poses. Chapter eight, prone poses. Chapter nine, arm support poses, which actually downward facing dog is in. So um, just to consider the reason why I'm listing this for you is if you if you open up your, your manuals there and you go to an empty um, create a class template, you'll see that I've asked you to create a class that incorporates the movements of the spine. So they are your forward fold, your back bend, your side bend, your twist, your inversion, and your extended where you're standing like in a mountain posture. So for every class that you create, you want to integrate the different movements of the spine when you're choosing your asana. And this can go a long way if you're trying to figure out, well, I don't know how to assemble class. I don't know where to start. I would start with yoga snippets and I would add in a couple of the yoga snippets um, because those transitions are done for you. And then if you want to add some spice, add some flair, add some new stuff, then if you're already, if your yoga snippet is already demonstrating, let's say standing pose, then I would integrate this book by going to chapter four and find some standing poses and add the standing poses to the yoga snippets. 
And I think that that's a really nice way of doing it. And I recommend that you do this weekly over the course of 52 weeks so that at the end of the year, you have 52 refined um, classes that you've worked on. But more than that, you've had a chance to really go in and see what are the primary movers of the, of the um, highlighted posture each week, rather than trying to tackle the totality of, of the knowledge, you know, uh, the vast, vast knowledge uh, held by Leslie Kamenoff. So that's how I use this book. I use this book as a handbook, as a guide. So each week I'll pick a posture that has my attention and I'll break it down a little bit more. I might share what the primary movers are in in the class with the students on that posture, but not every posture, uh, because we don't want it to be heady. It's yoga, right? We want it to remain yoga. Um, and then the other thing is, is when you're when you're thinking about how to go about approaching a class, how to go about breaking it all down, then again, same thing. You would want to group together the standing postures, the seated postures, the kneeling postures, supine and prone. And so. One thing I've seen newer instructors do is just think, oh, I, I, they're, they're making a, together a class and they think about some posture that they were introduced to in a class not long ago and then um, integrate that, that asana in the middle of it. And so it's a disrupted flow in that we, we were standing and now we're seated and now we're standing again, or we were face down and now we're kneeling and now we're face up and then we're back to standing. And so I would say, first things first, group your postures in the basic movement of these categories, right? And then highlight and come to understand the anatomy as you go through the course of a year, right? Each week, highlighting one posture that you know inside and out with your soul and return to it, right? I don't know that I could embody this total amount of vast information that's in this little book. Uh, you know, no matter how many times I went back to it, there will always be something new that, that I understand about it as the seasons of my life go. Uh, so when putting together a class, kind of consider that. So we are going to be going through the list that I provide you of the asanas just to give you an idea of what are these primary movers. Um, at the end, I'll give uh, an opportunity for anybody that's interested in signing up for the fundamentals, a little Q&A. We'll do that. Uh, we won't be on... Uh, this YouTube live this whole time. So we'll, we'll turn that off and then we'll have our private sessions as yoga teacher training cohort and breakout into breakout rooms and create classes based on what we've learned today. So that's the overview of what we've got going on today. I do hope that that is helpful for you. So, okay. So let me jump on over. So when we think about pranayama, uh, you know, the other day, for those of you that were on the live call uh, with the EDGE team with Leslie, he was talking about um, where is pranayama in contraindicated? Where do we have to be careful? Uh, when is it completely fine? And, you know, I think my take on that is making sure that anything in yoga, whether it be pranayama or asana, is that the benefits outweigh the risks. And so, you know, folks with things like high blood pressure or uh, glaucoma or, you know, certain things like that, um, heart issues, lung issues, you know, anything, any restrictions that their medical team has given them, I, I would, I would yield to that. Um, but for most people, as long as you're not doing any extreme movements, as far as, you know, the breath work goes, we're meant to breathe, right? And so retention to hold the breath for a, for a cleansing moment, good, to hold the breath for an extended period of time, risky. And so, um, you know, some say that you're best off working with a yoga teacher or practitioner if you're going to be trying some of those not more advanced, I like the word extreme, um, shifts of, breath of breathing. So consider that. So what we let in, what we let out, and how we go about doing so, that would be on our pranayama uh, lesson. And today we're really, we're getting into, um, we're getting into the asana. So, okay, so the first one being Tadasana Mountain Pose, right? We wanna find like a nice clean line where if the big toes were to touch, and for some, they may take a wider stance and that's completely fine. But if the big toes were to touch, finding that line between the toes and up through the center of the body where the knees are in alignment, 
right to the spine and almost as though we have like an imaginary lift from the crown of our head extending up. So if we consider it that way, is the energy going top down or bottom up? Well, it can change and your approach to it can change. So as you decide you want to teach this posture, maybe this week you cue it from the soles of your feet and cue it on up. And maybe next week you change it up and you start at the top and you cue it on down. Um, generally speaking, I cue it from feet up. I think that the mindfulness of a standing posture and, and the integrity of the posture it shows up in the base of support that it rests upon, and that's the feet. Uh, so kind of considering that, um, sometimes though, it's interesting to watch, and one of the reasons why I will shift around the cues and the order of the cues and won't just do it only one way, is that I'll see that at the onset of the cues at the soles of the feet, for example, you know, we have those intrinsic and extrinsic foot, foot muscles working. And then as we move our way up, by the time we get to our shoulders, maybe folks have forgotten what's going on with the feet and the feet are, have just splayed, however, because they've moved, you know, their attention now to their shoulders. And so that would be one reason why I would switch up how I go about doing it. So with that, mountain pose. When we think about what, where, where the originating idea of of where to put the feet in mountain pose is we really want to respect if we consider this the foot, we want to respect a nice clean triangle there where we have three points of support on each foot. And for those that are you that are following along this, this would be page 36. And we also want to honor the arches of the feet and the lift of the arches of the feet. And for some that might be visible depending on their physical structure, or structure and for some it might not be visible depending on their physical structure. And that's, that's all, all totally fine. Um, there's so many muscles and bones and tenants and, and, and all sorts of things happening in, in the feet structure. So just take a moment and glance if you've got your book in front of you, uh, page 37, so that you can just get an idea of that. So much happening there. And so it would stand to reason that if one side was off balance or underdeveloped and the other side was overdeveloped because maybe the tendencies of movements favor that side, which is common in humans, then it would make sense that from the base of the for support from the feet on up, but that could continue all throughout the body. So if we think about somebody who has a knot in their neck, we might want to look at their mountain posture and see is the base of support providing an evenly balanced template for the body to then rest upon. So just kind of considering things like that because it's all connected, right? We definitely want to think about that. Um, okay, so with, with mountain pose, we see it in different ways depending on lineages. And again, for those of you that were on the call um, with Leslie, uh, the other day that was just so incredibly lovely. He was talking about where, where you put the foot um, and where you put the hands and all of that so much depends on lineage. You know, hands together, hands down, palms facing the thighs, palms facing forward. People can get really heady in a yoga class and they want to know the answer. And so as a teacher, I guess what you could do if you wanted to hold space for that is you could cho choose a lineage and have an answer based on the lineage that you yourself follow, um, which would serve the student that wants the answer to the question. But I do not know that it would serve the student's permission to themselves that it really is truly about now navigating the waters and seeing where it feels right for you as a practitioner, it's going to vary from one person to the next. So I don't know that the right answer exists. Um, and I think an approach to yoga is one that, you know, includes, um, includes a medley of the lineages. So, but as a yoga teacher, you get to decide how you want to come about that. I will say that you will seem to be more credible and an expert in your field if you just have a pat answer that yes, you know, the hands are facing the thighs and this is why. Um, but I, I can't, I'd be re remiss if I didn't say, I think that has more to do with ego and being able to say, oh my gosh, I know so much about this. Let me teach you all that I know, rather than why don't we feel our way through this? And I think that Leslie, if he's 
you know, taught me anything in, in working with him, it, it is that. It, it very much is that. And so if you're doing it one way, then just try doing it a different way and see if you can mix it up and how that goes while feeling. So the next one, Utkanasana, uh, chair pose. And technically that A is silent for my purists out there for Sanskrit. Um, my focus isn't really on Sanskrit, it's on English, um, but you can do whatever makes you feel happy. So as we, as we look at this one here, I'm on page 40, as we look at this one here, the whole body is fired up. And this will largely depend on how deep the seat is. Right, and as, ex as we extend those arms up overhead, but see, do notice that the moment we change with the modification and we invite them to bring the hands to prayer, then we, we're not gonna see uh, the same muscle usage, the same primary movers that you see demonstrated here that are fired up. It will obviously shift because they're not going to be working um, in the same way as they would if the arms were extended. Again, there's no right or wrong in this. By being able to bring the arms from up to heart center might allow the practitioner to sit more deeply this week and then maybe next week not sit as deeply and instead choose to bring the arms up. Both are fine. Recently, I learned, this is a fun fact, that's actually a sketch of Leslie himself. So this book has Leslie in it. Um, I'm not sure if it has Amy Matthews in it uh, or who all else is in it. Uh, but I thought that, that, yeah, that's Amy. That's Amy and Matthew. Um, I think this might be Jay for extended hand toe pose, though I'm not certain and I, I wouldn't say. But, you know, I always thought when I first saw this book that these were just um, ambiguous sketches of humans. I didn't realize they were renditions of people that were actually studied during the practice to help aid in identifying the primary mover. So I think that that was pretty cool. Oh, all right, so moving on to page 44. So no, I won't read the entire book to you, but I just want to be able to touch on and have you use this required reading as a guide to develop how do I look at postures, how do I see postures. Uh, so extended hand toe pose or standing big toe hold, which whichever, tomato, tomato, right? So here we see that rested hand on the hip. Notice how relaxed and soft it is. We don't see very many uh, muscles fired up on this. <clears throat> the muscle usage is all about the core, the upper leg complex, and the arm that's holding the toe. Now, depending on the modification that the uh, student might take, that's also going to change greatly. So if they attempt to bend at the knee, this is going to change it up. In my experience, bending on one knee, and this would be like from my bar training, bending on one knee with the other leg not on the floor is actually harder once you, once you bend that knee, then if you keep the leg straight. Uh, so for me, I would more readily keep this leg straight and maybe use a bar or maybe use a strap if reaching the toe, you know, wasn't, wasn't right for me. I am also more inclined to do this posture seated, but again, it is going to change up what it looks like. So you need to decide what's right for you. Um, also as individuals, like what does our potty want to do and how does that look, right? So as we move on through in your breakout rooms, you guys, when, when, when you pair off and you choose which postures you want to do, at that point, you can look up the classification and level. And then I will have you guys identify the joint actions, what's working, the lengthening, the obstacles, the notes, the breathing, you know, as <clears throat> laid out in this book. So you guys have that to look forward to. Uh, okay, so next up will be tree pose. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> and what I love better, uh, what I love about tree pose is how much is going on in the primary movers there, all the way from the feet and on up, but high up into the thoracic cage, which I don't often consider that absent studying the anatomy behind it because so so often students are more fixated on how high the foot can go than maybe how high up the body can we integrate the primary movers and finding muscles firing. So in this way, if you are able to bring your foot above the knee and set at the inside of your thigh, fantastic. 
Um, if not, it needs to go below the knee and not on the knee joint. And it's not that anything's going to happen that day, probably, although if you fall, then we might be seeing a surgeon on that knee. Um, however, it's more, I think, about um, over time right? And that's the big thing. Like, oh no, I can do this. See, I can do this. And the next thing, you know, you know, the yogis all bandaged up. So I think the bigger thing isn't so much it, where can the foot go? I think the bigger thing is how can I get the, um, the muscles of the core engaged in part of this? So thinking about that. So we'll take a two minute break uh, since we're at the half hour and continue on in a moment. Okay. So continuing on. So I jumped down to page uh, 48, which is two pages later than where we just were to see the back of tree pose. So you can take a, a look at the muscle usage just on the back of the body. Uh, so always make sure that you go a couple of pages out and make sure that you get both the front and the back for the primary movers. So that's something that you want to keep an eye open while going through this. Um, so that posture, tree posture, uh, creates a nice um, lead in for eagle pose, and which is on page 50. And one of the reasons why I feel that is that we've had a chance to prime the muscles to get them fired up to get them engaged and ready to go. And now we might move into something like eagle pose. So in that way, eagle pose could prove to be a really nice apex pose. And for those of you that caught my apex lecture already, you know that we move towards a posture by preparing the body for it. Not so much that it's the hardest posture that we have, but more that we move our body towards this, this apex. And then on the other side of it, we bring it down. And so commonly the postures that we did on the front half are different than the second because uh, uh, the apex pose could really have us working. And so then we're on the other side of the hill after the apex pose. So the main, main key thing is in this one, we have our balanced postures. What we've chosen is an apex pose, which is very, very common and popular in classes. Uh, and having already fired up our, our core and our balanced postures and our prior movies and our glutes are going and our, our hammies are going and all that, and we're ready then then the practitioner might be warm enough and have a little bit more flexibility in their connective tissue to lengthen and stretch a, a little more deeply into this posture than had you done it another way. Again, there is no right or wrong of this. I think it's just all about um, what approach to yoga do you want to take? How do you want to go about sharing that with your practitioners and so on? Uh, so, okay, so moving on from there, oh, the lovely king of the dancer's pose. So this is a fun activity. If you Google dancer's pose, and I don't want you to do it right now, but I do want you to put it on your notes to do's. 
you will see pages and pages and pages of postures that look nothing alike. And it really honestly just depends on what variation of dancer's pose you're taking. For one, are you standing? Are you seated? Are you kneeling? Are you reaching for the toe? Are you using a strap to reach for the toe? How close can we get to the primary movers in this posture if right now our practice is not bringing us to the king of the dancer's pose? So for in my experience, what I personally do, what's worked for me is to unpack dancer pose into two different postures. So I would do eagle prior to this so that I could get the benefits of the primary movers of the leg that you see fired up here, right? Um, and then a little bit later in the sequencing, I might do um, dancer's pose on the mat and with the aid of a strap so that I could try and recreate as closely as I can these primary movers that you see fired up in this book here, but you're on the mat at the time. Uh, otherwise, what I commonly see is uh, folks just trying to get a hold of that foot. And if you if you put them under an x-ray, you might, well, you would see muscles with an x-ray, but put them under an MRI, you wouldn't see these primary movers being used. You would uh, quite likely see something that's asymmetrical if, if their practice is just not there. And so I think, again, we need to revisit the idea behind ego in that we don't want our practitioners to just want to hold the foot, right? We want the practitioners to experience the reason we're headed towards holding the foot and the journey to get to the foot. And, you know, some of that, and I know Leslie was saying in our, our meeting the other day, that some of that has as much to do with what we let go of than what, what we grab hold of. So we might grab hold of the strength or the flexibility uh, or the balance ability or the mindfulness to get into this king of dancer's pose. Uh, but maybe maybe the trouble is has more to do with what we're not releasing, what we're not letting go of, and therefore uh, don't have the flexibility that we might seek. So it's an interesting dance between the two different ideas and one worth exploring in your journey. And certainly not, a, you know, it's not a test question idea. It's definitely much more of an essay. Uh, okay, so moving on, page 54, about a quarter of the way here. Make sure I am on 54. Yes. Uh, there we have Amy in uh, Warrior One. Chest is open, hands are wide, and the lower leg or the lower arm complex from the elbow down is soft. And so most of the primary movers are happening um, through the core, through the legs, and then coming up through. Um, through the shoulders up to the delts and so on. So again, this would change if, if you invite your practitioner to bring the hands to prayer, for example, then I believe it's a lot less likely that you're gonna see the pecs fired with the hands to prayer. Um, the deltoids you might see fired depending on how back their shoulders are or something like that. But for the most part, the moment you bring the hands to prayer, much of what you see here is greatly impacted and changed. Um, so just keeping an eye on these things, not that there's a right way or a wrong way, but more that if, if you're aiming to, let's say you're teaching yoga for bodybuilders, example, so um, many bodybuilders kind of have a tendency to curve forward if, they're, if they haven't put something in their practice that's going to help their shoulders come back, right? So that, that's just really common. And so here, one of the main benefits to having your bodybuilder show up for yoga class would be to stretch those pecs. So if anything, I would have the arms go up in warrior one. And if anything, I would take a more narrow stance in the feet. Um, and then I would move away from like a vinyasa flow for this. Instead, I would go more of a, a, a nice, maybe like a mini yin, not quite a yin, but you know, more of a, what we see on the schedule is called hatha, although, you know, hatha is hatha. But can we see on the schedule, it's called hatha, where the expectation is that we hold the postures a little bit longer, uh, allowing a chance for the muscle to really, you know, take shape, take form and release. And for those of you that have heard my analogy about Laffy Taffy, this is so much it. If we warm the Laffy Taffy up and we stretch it, it's really pliable. If we hold it in a stretch for some time, it is not going to spring right back. And the body works the same way. So those are some ideas that I can share with you on that. Um, if you moved in the next page of the book, Book, I think the main key thing to keep an eye on here is where the weight is distributed between the front foot, front foot and the back foot. 
So giving, giving that more um, attention than pulling out a tape measure and seeing how far apart can we get the feet to go. And, and I bring this up, although it seems to be an obvious thought, because oftentimes that's what practitioners are trying to do. They're just trying to get it wider, wider, wider. And wider is not always better or longer, depending on how you look at it. Uh, all right, so finding that, that breathing component in there, lovely, 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 moving on. Again, you're gonna to wanna to take note when you're in your breakout rooms with the joint actions, what's working, what's lengthening, and so what the obstacles are, creating a separate, uh, a separate notes file and adding a breathing component there. Okay, so cruising right along for, <clears throat> to page 58, warrior two. Uh, so again, same thing where if we have the um, if we have the arms up and fired, we're going to see more engagement in the neck there, right? And then as we move down, the legs will hold us up and so on. Whereas let's say if we take that back arm and we invite it to the hip, like if it's more comfortable for you, feel free to to drop that back arm and rest it on the hip or allow it to you know, lie alongside you still fine, but just know that that's going to change up the primary mu muscles that are working there and also the pecs minor up top. Um, so just some things to keep an eye on as far as how do I go about offering an all levels class? Where do I offer the modifications? What does that look like? And what happens when I do? This is the understanding that I aspire you to have a strong hold on prior to graduation. So number three is warrior three, lovely posture. I do this one in bar yoga all the time, always, because it's so nice just to rest the sides of those fingers um, on the bar and see if you can even bring it lifted up, hovering just above the bar, knowing that the support of the bar is there. I notice that, um, that students tend to relax into that uh, so much more readily, maybe because fear isn't there. Going back to, you know, the idea of what are you holding on to? What are you letting go? What are you letting in? Right? Same kind of thing. So this is really nice for bar yoga. Again, we want the, we want the legs standing. I personally are standing straight. I personally find this posture to be more accessible straight than with a bent knee, um, just because like a, a fulcrum kind of idea. Uh, so if you don't have a bar, uh, you know, the new thing that Cassandra was using the other day was one of those standing desks. I'm like, that's a great idea because I usually normally say kitchen counter, but people don't always want to do exercise, you know, maybe the kitchen counter, who knows, you know, but I liked the standing desks and so many folks have those nowadays. You can completely move a few things out of the way, slide your office chair off to the side and, and get some yoga in with the aid of a standing desk. And I think that's a really solid, solid idea. Um, just reinforcing that the standing desk is not on wheels, isn't going to go flying um, and so on. Um, so some things to think about. Okay, moving on, extended side angle. So lovely, lovely. This one, I think the body needs it so much. This is a movement of the spine. We don't get all that much where we're, we're opening up the side body, right? Like we bend forward, we do a lot of that. We sit, sometimes maybe we even do back bends, twists, and versions, but that side, that side bend, I think is so, so instrumental. So I would say that extended side angle has a right in almost every one of my yoga classes. Um, I think it's just a great place to be. Um, the key thing with this one is, as you can see demonstrated in the book, if you have it, is that he's got the black behind the foot and the hand resting on the block. And I think that's instrumental in that folks sometimes get the idea that the idea is about the hand hitting the floor. And it is not about the hand hitting the floor. You can use a block to bring the floor to the hand based on limb length. So we're not trying to stretch Armstrong our limbs longer so that they can reach the floor. And if you really look at the anatomy of this posture, if you're trying to um, harness what cues will I use, if you're trying to if you're trying to harness that, then if you're if your intent as a practitioner on your fingertips reaching the floor, you might see that side body on the on the obliques there, the external obliques that are fired up. Those are going to collapse when all of a sudden the the waist wants to bend some to try and conform to reaching for the floor. So while those who have long limbs may reach for the floor, um, I think that until my arms grow longer. I will probably use a block if I want to achieve the most advanced version of this posture as far as anatomy goes. So 
you can take um, that with you in your heart everywhere you go. Uh, okay, so let's revolve it, you know, this revolved side angle pose. I think, uh, and in this posture here, page 64, he's bound, he's got his hands together, they're clasped. Um, and so if, if you, oh, I should mention that the digital PDF may be somewhat different than your paper copy, but I'm guessing if you're following along, you figured that out by now. Sorry, I didn't mention sooner. Okay, so when we take the, when we take a revolved, we essentially change up the entire posture and, and create a really nice way of stretching out the whole, well, not stretching out, but lengthening throughout the body, strengthening throughout the body and looking at it from a different lens, right? From maybe um, where we were before, where we are now. You don't need the bind to have that happen, although it's a bonus, you could use a strap. So I would rather see somebody use a strap if the bind truly really isn't in their practice yet, than see uh, the primary movers here fall apart. And again, and that usually happens in the form of the waist is bending so the hands can reach each other. So that those are some key things you can look for in a yoga class. The other thing I really love about this is the front and the back of the legs are really fired up. This is a great stretch. And so if we're trying to grab those hands and that's not really in the practice and we're starting to bend the knee, still okay, but know that it's going to shift the primary movers. And I would even say to play around with it, like week one, use a strap, you know, week two, bend the knee, week three, go for it, still have the option of the strap or the knee, toggle between them, teach your practitioner what it feels to explore poses such as these until one day, finally, they find, oh, I've got it. And I was able to bind. And that is lovely. There's something to be said for the reward that comes from consistently doing the work and returning to the class week after week after week and so on and refining your movement and understanding of your movement. And this is one reason why I say to teachers, I don't recommend brand new programming every week. You know, switch out a couple few things each week, switch out your theme, your meditation, your intention, all of those things, even, you know, the incense that you have going or preferably essential oils in a diffuser, I would say. Um, but, but have the practitioners have something that they know that you're working on or you're featuring side, a re, um, revolve side angle pose all of February and they can count on seeing that, you know, each week in the class, you know, and, and I think that that's nice. That gives people um, a chance to master what they know. And it's not as glitzy, okay? And I will admit that. Like, there's there's not that, um, like, oh, it's lovely. I love the class. It's new stuff every week. But I don't know that new stuff every week equates to mastery the way let's go back at it again. Let's go back at it again. Let's look at it this way. Let's let's work with it that way. Let's try it on this other day. Let's turn the heat up. Let's turn the heat out and so on. And the impact on it until your, pop, until your practitioner figures out what their sweet spot is. So I hope that that is helpful for you. Trikonasana, page 66, triangle pose. Same thing as what we saw on extended side angle. So it, it is not about reaching the floor. So as teachers though, sometimes we, we are well-meaning. I, I'm, I can't think of a yoga teacher that I know that didn't mean well, but they might use um, verbiage that sounds like, that's okay, you'll get there. You'll be able to reach the floor, just keep at it, right? So it sounds like encouragement, but really the, the language behind that encouragement suggests that the right way to do it includes the fingertips on the floor. And so that is a mindset. If you have that mindset, that's okay, but I invite you to maybe consider making a shift there on that one. Uh, okay, so moving through. So again, same thing as we saw before, revolve it. So I think a nice way to put together programming isn't to, you know, write down 50 postures that you can share, you know, in one day, like, you know, show a little side, but leave some to the imagination. But it also to add the revolved into any postures that allows for doing so. I think that that, that makes for a more well-rounded class. I think it's an engaging class, but I also think you're not, you're not straying so far off the median that the, the teacher, the teacher, may or may not know what's next, but the student definitely does not know. So you want it to have an organic flow of movement in there. And that's where I think the revolved um, options in pretty much any of these postures is a really nice choice and can be found in my classes for sure. 
Uh, okay, this next one here as we come to uh, into 70, uh, intense side stretch. I, I've seen this called different things. Um, I like this one quite a bit. I think that in the grand scheme of things, the world needs this posture. And again, my key things really is going to be more than anything is maintaining the alignment that we tapped into for the warrior one for the hips down. That's going to be the main thing. And then once we have that alignment, then move into this. So it's quite likely that I would put this posture after warrior one in sequencing. So I've already just tabbed them in that whole thing and then just send them down. Um, you can reach it back with your arms in reverse. Namaskar, which is just so nice, right? And again, looks like the bind. The first op opportunity I gave might be, um, let's invite the thumbs to the hips you know, just to give them an idea that the arms are headed to the back of the body and then progress into it as it goes. So that one's nice. Uh, love myself a prosarita. You're going to see one in every one of my classes. Um, so you'll find this in the manual under star hinge plies. So this is just a nice, nice wide stance forward bend. Everything's firing. Everything's working. Key thing is we want a little mini space between the floor and the crown of the head, making sure that you know, the muscles are truly firing and truly engaged. Uh, many people can float up into um, tripod headstand from this place. And it's quite lovely to see it, although you probably won't find it in Michelle's easy yoga class. But, you know, it's, it's a goodie. It's a goodie for sure. I love it. Um, again, as we move to the next page, we start to see um, the integration of the lower leg complex uh, being built up. And for those of you that were here for my bar training last week, same thing so often people fall and sometimes that's the end of life and for seniors you know it might happen in the bathroom and so i think the ability of yoga to be able to get into those intricate muscles and develop them to aid things like balance so that we don't have the probability is high for falling it's just huge uh, okay, moving on into a squat. So no yoga class is complete without a squat. These are really relevant in uh, prenatal yoga. And so for that training, when we talk about, uh, you know, that, that yoga squat and getting into it, um, I think a nice, a nice modification that I use for squat is to have a block. I don't really do the stack of books thing, a block. Um, and then that way the practitioner can sit on the block, but understand that if, if you give them that choice, that it's likely that the spine might not have that lengthening and may, may not come down as, as freely and organically as meant to be. And maybe it be the better, the better of the two wouldn't be to use a block, but rather maybe just don't go down as far or use the aid of like a bar or something like that. Uh, but those squats are really, really important. So much going on with the pelvic floor and all of that. So those are some of the standing postures. And so we're gonna go ahead and take a two minute break on this one, and then we will get it going with our seated poses next. Okay, let me continue on. So chapter five, seated poses, and we're wrapping up and we're going to be going into our breakout room. So I won't be able to give you the time on the individual postures on these. I'll do the, a different 
a different segment on that, but I do just kind of want to move through them just a little bit. I think the key thing with seated postures is that base of support, you know, develop that first and foremost. I think they do a nice job in the illustrations here in the blue of, you know, where we have contact with the floor um, and what happens when it's something other than that, right? So our, our key thing is just finding that upright, working those erector spinae, those muscles that hold you upright all day long, work so hard for us and so on. So key things like that. Um, so for West back stretching, if you, um, if you bend the knees, this is greatly, greatly impact what goes on here. So it's not so much about reaching the feet. I'd rather see a strap used. Um, I've also seen bolsters uh, under the belly there, which is nice, which helps the practitioner move towards this posture. And, you know, where wherever their body goes is, is where their body goes and so on. Uh, okay, so if we take... Um, there we go, I'll get a little bit down. If we take uh, one leg in and leave one out, we are now head to knee pose. And I think we see this one a little bit more often in yoga class. And I think that it's a good idea, idea because I think that it's a better chance that we can have that similar experience of stretch that we had with both feet extended as we can doing it one at a time. And you know, it's great if you can do them both at the same time, but I would probably progress it from here to there and then back to this and give, give your practitioners a choice if they want both legs out or one leg out or how they're going to go about doing it with the emphasis being on the sole of the feet moving towards the inner thigh or still staying away from the knee joint. So even though we're not standing, right, per se, uh, the likelihood as, as a practitioner is determined to reach that foot, which often happens, uh, sometimes the pressure of the sole of the foot could um, impact that knee joint off the side and, and cause some real damage. So we need to decide where the foot's going to be and keep emphasis on that as we continue to cue throughout. Uh, okay, so similar thing, revolved head to knee pose as we move it off to the side. Same thing as we saw before. So Amy's posture here, um, definitely um, very flexible. Uh, lots of muscle usage there. Probably not what we would see the average practitioner showing up in a yoga class do. So uh, if you use a strap though, um, your side bend is more likely to become a twist. So those are the kind of key things that I want you to look out for, for when you're deciding, you know, the strap isn't even the end all be all one. Um, I would say with this one, you might be better off maybe bending at the knee and sending the knee back a little bit and then just taking turns on sides to get that, that leg stretch that we have on either side. That's probably how I personally would approach it. Uh, okay, so for your seated wide angle bend, uh, lovely. Again, here she reaches for the feet and it's also demonstrated with her hands coming forward. Usually when I cue these things so that there isn't any like peer pressure for my students and then we'll wrap this part up and send you off into your rooms. Um, Usually for my students, the approach to something such as seated wide angle fold demonstrated on page 90 of this book is to have the hands forward and now everyone's face is down and maybe even I have their forehead on the block, which is lovely. We still have that same nurturing contact, you know, like would be reminiscent of a, a baby nursing. So there, it's calming to the neurological system. The body likes this. So maybe the forehead to a block, fingertips, you know, reaching forward for those of you that want to reach for the feet, you know, and then guide them through that, but then bring them back to the hands reaching forward and then maybe ragdoll up, I think is a nice way for for an instructor to empower the student. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to empower them to choose the right variation, not modification, but the right variation of any given asana that is right for them. So we'll go ahead and take a two minute break and head on out to our breakout rooms. For those of you on the YouTube, thanks for joining me so much. Have a beautiful day and namaste.